Thank you all so much for coming out to tonight's healing conversation. My name is Dr. Lena Green, and I'm the executive director of the HOPE Center. HOPE stands for Healing on Purpose and Evolving, and we are a freestanding mental health clinic connected to the historic First Corinthian Baptist Church where you are sitting right now. I have over 20 years of clinical experience in working with men in mental health, specifically also working with fathers. I also consider myself a fatherhood practitioner. I've been developing programs, services, and events for black men for over 15 years. And tonight, we are incredibly excited to address ways to promote healing in our community. Uh, we wanna start by first thanking our sponsors, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Gary Carpenter, who is the Chief Medical Officer for the medical care practice with Sync Care to come up and give us some greetings for a minute or two. Please welcome Dr. Gary Carpenter. All right, good evening, everybody. How's everybody feeling tonight? Amen. All right, so um, as she stated, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Care Medical Practice. It's a practice that's in Brooklyn, and we are one of the practices that are under the bigger network, um, which is called Sync Care. So Sync Care is the, one of the main things I'm here to talk about. I wanted to introduce this idea to you um, about Sync Care. It's a game-changing health innovation that is, a renovate, um, that is totally revolutionizing the way that we approach patient care. Um, it's called Sync Care, and it has the potential to transform the way we um, actually approach the healthcare landscape as we know it. Um, Sync Care is a comprehensive healthcare platform that leverages cutting-edge technology and leverages, um, <clears throat> pardon me, leverages the cutting-edge technology to provide personalized, access, accessible care to the patients. It brings together the power of artificial intelligence as well as data analytics and telemedicine. Um, to give patients a better care experience. So the reason why I think this is so important is because one of the biggest issues, especially in our community, is access. We don't have access, and that access causes us to have poor health healthcare outcomes. So now that we have this apparatus, we're utilizing it so that we can provide care in the home, which is where we want care to happen the most. You know, patients that are at most at risk, we set them up with what's called patient health navigators, and those health navigators actually help to facilitate appointments to our offices or to offices for a subspecialist or anything else like that. Um, we also work to work with practices, so we are basically a nationwide company, Syncare, and we work with practices to improve on efficiency and, you know, communication between patients, and we actually call our patients family members, you know, because that's what we want, that's the whole idea and the culture of um, sync here. The other thing about sync here that I thought was most novel and that really excited me and got me to actually leave the practice I was with before and join them is that our main goal is to narrow health care gaps in black and brown communities. So our focus is to really take care of the community. That's the whole point of it. I'm encouraging you all, if you don't have a primary care doctor, that is the first step. It is imperative that we all get set up with a primary care doctor. Don't wait on anything. Don't wait till you get sick. Don't wait till it's too late. Go get ahead, because the whole point of what I'm trying to talk about is prevention. We want to prevent hospitalizations. We want to prevent any bad outcomes. We don't want you to end up on dialysis. We don't want these type of things to happen. And if we are proactive and get ahead of it, we can make a big, big difference. All right, so that's all I have for tonight. You know, thank you guys so much. I'm honored, and back to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of quick shout-outs before we um, get back to uh, our panelists. Um, so just a few folks in the house. Um, uh, Brother Boyce, uh, representing the W5 Corridor for Omega Psi Phi. Brian Benjamin, former Lieutenant Governor. The District Attorney's Office is here. Billy Council from Council Him, the founder, um, and then Re Reggie Miller from 100 Black Men. So thank you all. Okay, now we're gonna have a little audience participation. Are you ready? Okay, that wasn't super enthusiastic, but that's okay. 
All right, so you are going to now turn to your neighbor, introduce yourself, and let them know which superhero you wanted to be when you were younger. Okay, you got 30 seconds. Go for it. for your participation. So, many of the men that I've worked with often carry the notion that is carry the notion of a superhero into adulthood. And superheroes are most often reluctant to show their perceived weakness. So this hiding of how men can feel has really led to a mental health crisis among black men and boys in America. The mental health crisis is based on one in three black adults with mental illness receives treatment despite the fact that they are more likely to experience emotional distress than their white counterparts. The mental health crisis is based on a suicide rate for black youth has risen faster than any other racial group in the past two decades, with an increase of suicide rates by 60% for black males ages 10 to 19. The mental health crisis is based on a community trauma that passes from one generation to the next and ongoing disparities that we see often played out in the criminal justice system. The good news though, is that tonight we are gathered to identify solutions to help stop this crisis. And with that, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists. So first up is Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike is the senior pastor of First Corinthian Baptist Church here in Harlem. Uh, under Pastor Mike's leadership over the past 13 years, uh, the membership, excuse me, the past, how many years are we going on now, Pastor Mike? 20 years. 20 years. The membership has grown from 300 since he first came here to over 10,000. <laughs> pastor Mike is passionate, is a passionate mental health advocate, and in 2016, he created the Hope Center which is the freestanding mental health clinic where I now work. So the Hope Center again provides free, I repeat, free mental health services. Um, and that's, uh, that free mental health service is available to anyone who lives in New York City. Next up, we have Roll Andrews. <laughs> Mr. Andrews is the executive director of the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, known as APAF. Uh, the foundation is responsible for overseeing psychiatry fellowships to equip underrepresented psychiatrists with training and opportunities to serve the most vulnerable Americans. He is also the president of the DC Bar Association. And he is uh, the previous, he's part of the previous national leadership for AARP. He was also honored, you can clap it up for that. And he was also honored with the President Joseph R. Biden Jr. Lifetime Achievement Award in January of 2023. Our third panelist is Dr. Hankerson. He is the Vice Chair of Psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And he has been treating patients in Harlem for over 15 years. He's a national expert um, partnering with community-based organizations to reduce racial uh, mental health disparities. He is also um, a member of the National Football League, the NFL's Behavioral Wellness Committee, and second opinion physician for the National Basketball League. I'll give it up for Dr. Hankerson. And so with that, I'm gonna take my seat amongst the panelists. Um, and we're gonna kick them off with our first question. And what I'd like to ask all of you is, can you share a piece of your personal mental health journey? And Pastor Mike, we're gonna start with you. Good evening. Uh, first, I wanna just thank uh, Dr. Green for the vision. Uh, let's give it up for Dr. Green for 
not only the vision for this event, but her team at the Hope Center for doing an amazing job of coordinating not just this event, but the amazing uh, public facing work as well that the Hope Center does, so I'm, I'm grateful. I'll be very brief. My mental health journey probably started from the time I was 10 years old, um, but I was intentional about seeking help in 2012. Um, in part, years of dealing with undiagnosed depression that I didn't realize I had, in part because of my own personal battles with um, a, a incurable disease, now that we know what it is, called CVID, Common Variable Immunodeficiency, which means that I was born uh, with no antibodies, so I really have no immune system. Didn't get diagnosed till late in life, but multiple, multiple hospitalizations, chronic pain, chronic infection. Um, I've had sepsis three times in my lifetime, but from the time I was 10 years old, this kind of medical ailment started, and I didn't understand, you know, in those days, you're talking about the 70s, 80s, nobody was talking about mental health for children, nobody was talking about young people in mental health, no one was thinking that young people suffered from anxiety disorder or depression at that time, but that's what was happening to me. And when I started seeing a therapist in 2012, I had been here eight years at that point, I, I was at a point where I was almost at wit's end in many ways because I, I was in a vocation where I serve the community and serve the needs of a congregation, but sometimes those who are viewed as conduits of healing for God often go neglected when it comes to their own healing. You pour out and pour out, and there's nothing returning. And what really triggered that for me before 2012 was probably around 2010, I had, out of nowhere, the first suicidal ideation I've ever had in my life in 2010. It's interesting now, I got called, uh, Dr. Green, just yesterday to do an interview about issues of clergy and suicide, because the rates of suicide among clergy is on the rise. And no one talks about that. But that journey started in 2012, where a therapist literally saved my life. And the impact she had on me was so great that I turned around here and led the congregation, went to the leadership and said, we need to hire a therapist on staff. And we did that in 2012 with Joyce Johnson, who was on staff because the pastors had issues with confronting issues and facing issues that we didn't have the capacity to handle. But I knew that if I was dealing with these things, there were so many other people who were dealing here in the congregation. So that was our first kind of entree into this area as a congregation. And then the amazing work we did partnering with Dr. Hankerson. But that journey in brief started 2012 intentionally for me, but it had been a lifelong battle with depression and anxiety that never went diagnosed. Thank you for that, that honesty. Roll. Good evening. It's good to see these brothers and those who love these brothers here, uh, both in the room of this sanctuary and online. Uh, this is part two, uh, Dr. Green, of this conversation. And for the first time, I shared as part of part one that I was a cutter as a teenager. And I wasn't a cutter in the way that many of us know cutters. Uh, but I would use my fingernails as an instrument of harm, an instrument of self-harm. So even to this day, while I've seen help through pediatricians and faith leaders, I will ask you, Pastor Mike, do I have any fingernail tips to this day? I don't wear fingernail tips to this day. As a matter of fact, even though I don't think I would hurt myself, if I see even the little inch, quarter inch of nail, I'm looking for a fingernail clip. In my briefcase in the green room here, I have a fingernail clipper. I have a fingernail clipper in my suitcase. I have a fingernail clipper uh, in the hotel room. Everywhere I can be where I think uh, I need it. And it, unfortunately, it's a constant reminder of who that 14-year-old boy was who was trying to be 14, 24, 44, 54, whatever it was. And I wasn't allowing myself to bloom. I didn't give myself permission to bloom. And I didn't even know how bad the situation was until one day, and I know there's some, uh, some mothers out there that, that uh, put milk on the table, 
for those big bowls of cereal that we like to consume. And I was going through my second bowl of uh, Fruit Loops, and my mother noticed that all my knuckles were gnawed off. And because it was summertime, Pastor Mike, and not during the school year, she couldn't attribute it to, oh, that's probably a sports injury, what have you. Like, what are you doing to your hands? And I didn't even realize how bad it was, but my hands were totally gnawed off. And so, you know, when I finally found my journey back all throughout all of the blessings I've had in my career to get back to mental wellness, you know, I thought that this was an opportunity, uh, particularly in the role that I have as, as the chief servant shepherd of the APA Foundation, black men can see one of their own who's on the journey, but who's also in leadership on the journey because what they tell me when I come up here from D.C., if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Y'all can make it. We can make it together, but the reality of it is we've got to be willing to look at help as a sign of strength and not as a sign of weakness. Thank you. Dr. Hankerson. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Green, for your vision in, in this panel. Um, my mental health journey really started in, in earnest in my last year of medical school. Um, the last year of medical school is supposed to be the easiest academically. Your course load is light. You're getting ready to, to finish up and start residency. Um, but for me, it was uh, stressful because I was working a lot. I was actually in a a uh, combined program. I was in med school during the day and at night I was taking business school classes uh, because I had a dream of becoming a, a CEO of a healthcare system. And so the, the workload was really intense. And so that was one stressor. And then there was some family drama that kind of emerged um, that I won't go into here, but there was some stuff we all know the saying, what happens in this house stays in this house. Well, when I was in my last year of medical school, what happened in our house came out of that house. And so that was something that um, really rocked my world. And then the other thing that really was a challenge was I was in a dating relationship and figuring out kind of what we, me and this young lady were gonna do in terms of where we were gonna go forward or not. And so there were periods in, in medical school during that time where I would literally stay in the bed 14 or 15 hours a day. And I remember that is when I fell in love with General Cho's chicken. <laughs> because that is literally all I ate. And I hear the last, so y'all know how good General Cho's chicken is, but if you eat it every other day, then you quickly pack on the pounds. I gained 30 pounds my last year of med school. That was the heaviest I've ever been in my life. And there, there were times when I was in the hospital after we would go around and see patients on the wards that I would just kind of sneak away and go into the bathroom. Grady Hospital in downtown Atlanta. And tears would just come down my face. And as I was looking at myself in the mirror, I was like, well, you got your white coat on. You're about to you know, be a doctor. You're going to graduate. You can push through this. But after months and months, that feeling never went away. And so I actually started seeing a therapist during that time, and it was the best decision that I ever made. And I still see a therapist every single week. But during that period in medical school, which was supposed to be one of the, the kind of crowning jewel moments of my life, it was really the, a, a pit of despair for me. And that was really, for me, what launched me on my mental health and wellness journey. Thank you all for such honest answers. Um, we often hear terms like real men don't cry or man, man, all right. Um, man up, right? And so how, do you, how did you each overcome these, these gender-based stereotypes of what it means to be a strong man, a strong black man, a strong brother? Perhaps you're still wrestling with some of that, even now, right? Yeah, I don't think the journey is over, Dr. Green. I think, 
you know, it's situational now. So in the original articulation of Man Up, it doesn't matter whether it's winter, summer, spring, or fall. You're supposed to man up. I think in the modern era, particularly as, as I think about my own uh, journey with manning up, it's more situational. There are some times when I think you do need to man up. And, and sometimes that's just like, you know what, it's Monday morning. I don't really feel like going to work. But I got bills to pay. I got responsibilities. So that's a man up situation, right? If you stub your baby toe on the, uh, on the curb, it's hard to man up. Am I right? Yeah, you're going to be as vulnerable as you could possibly be, you know, and so uh, I think we just have to be okay not being okay. But again, if I'm not okay, be okay talking to somebody in your community, family, circle of trust that says, you know what, you know, I need a 20-second timeout. I need a full timeout, right? I need to reset so I can come back better than I was before. So I will not, to be honest with you, I haven't gotten over it, but I do think I'm handling the situations better, and I'm trying to be appropriate to that situation. Yeah, uh, I love how you said that in terms of, of it being an ongoing process, and I completely agree because at each stage of life, I feel like we are reinventing what it is to be a man. And so I think, um, you know, for me, during that time when I was really struggling and in a deep depression, uh, part of the things that, that helped lift me out of that and overcome the notions of real men don't cry and that we shouldn't be getting help was a group of brothers who was, we were real with each other. We could just be honest with each other. Um, you know, my fraternity brothers at the time were just rocks for me. So that was one group. I was also in a, a basketball league through my church at the time. Um, that's when I actually thought that I could have hops and could dunk. Um, but they provided me with the support and the accountability that, you know what, Sydney, you are not yourself. You have a, a glass look on your face. I'll never for, I'll forget that say, one brother told me, you look like you're smiling on the outside, but I can see your eyes are empty. And so having brothers who can be honest, who can call you on your stuff, when in the world you're uh, doing imposter syndrome all day and trying to live this double consciousness that we have to live as black men, but having a group of men who can really call you and support you is really what helped me navigate. Um, I wanna answer that a little differently because before you hear the phrase man up, I heard the phrase, be a big boy, right, as a child. And for me, I was dealing with chronic sickness and I would often hear that, you know, I was always saying I wasn't feeling good, I wasn't feeling good, you gotta be a big boy, and you gotta, and I didn't understand what that meant and I shared with some before this night began, I used to always go to the, the, the school nurse when I was in elementary school and so I didn't feel well and one day, my mother, after talking to the nurse, we were home, I have to be like maybe eight, and says this word, used the word, and, and she didn't mean it maliciously, but she, talk, she said hypochondriac. The school nurse said this to her, and to think an eight-year-old child could be a hypochondriac, and my inquisitive self went and looked this thing up, and when I saw what it was, I said, no, that's not me. But here's a problem, when I heard that word, I heard be a big boy, I read it and saw what it meant. I then started to learn how to creatively camouflage my pain, not talk about it, not share it, because I didn't want to be called that name. And so what I did was overcompensate it by trying to present this facade as though I was all right, hurting, in pain, not feeling well, but I'm okay, I'm good, right? And so as a child, it wasn't necessarily the man that comes down the road, but it's really be a big boy, you know, you can deal with this. And I couldn't deal with it. There's no child who could deal with chronic pain or constant sickness. You can't deal with that. And so I had to learn to deal with that. And the problem is I then had certain models in my family. I'm, I'm from Barbados, my whole family, and this idea of what it meant to display some idea of masculinity was to be, if you think about it, the idea about man up or to be a man 
or to act like a man that we often tell children, little boys, to act like a man, what, it, what we're really saying is don't be human. Because to be human is to express emotion. And so when you begin to withdraw and hold back emotion, it is as if we're trying to hinder and undermine our own humanity by somehow feeling as though to be a symbol of what it means to be a man is to not honor the fullness of our humanity. When you hurt, you say, ouch. We're all saying, listen, let me tell you, that's a great example because a, a stub toe can break the strongest person down. When you hit the toe on the corner of the bed or something like that, and when you walk on right there like he just did. And so, right? So, so it is amazing how we learn this kind of narrative connected and not realizing the narrative is dehumanizing, right? So it is learning how to constantly overcome that. And, and for me, being emotional or showing emotion didn't say now I'm less of a man. It was saying I'm more human than you think. So to be expressive with my pain, expressive with my suffering, expressive with my sorrow, and then to communicate that and to share that openly is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of supreme strength when you feel comfortable enough to be able to say, hey, I hurt right now, I don't feel good right now, all is not well right now, and in fact, I need help now, right now. Because I had to do that to some of my friends when I was going through. You know, I call them up after I had that suicidal ideation in 2010, I called one of my best friends and I said, bro, something is going on. And I started telling him that. And what happened is it, that conversation spread with our, little, our crew of friends, some of my own line brothers, and all of a sudden our gathering shifted. It was talking about, man, what's going on? It's all well. Because then we start now openly having conversations about not mental health issues first, physical health issues. And I'll stop there, but let me say this, when you know, and I know that people are gonna identify, if you, if you go back over your mind, and you think back, and you think about what conversations were like with your friends when you were 20, and when you were 30, and you, when you were 40, right? Now in my 50s, what is interesting the conversations, not only are we more transparent, but the conversations change. We were at, a group of us get together every, after every Easter Sunday, we get together, and we, was, we caught ourselves. We were at one morning at the house. We got this Airbnb. We hanging out, going to play golf, all this stuff. We having breakfast. And we start comparing, like, blood pressure medication and, and, and who got this. And we talk, nah, nah, I take two of those, bro. Like, it was deep that the whole conversation now, I said, not Paul, I said, man, look at this conversation. We talking about what meds we taking and, and what our cholesterol levels are. And, and you know, was, but, but. That's the kind of conversation that leads to transformation when you can be vulnerable and transparent with people you call friends. And they can hold you accountable, right? Um, we're gonna go on the other end of the spectrum from the blood pressure medication. Um, Cause I wanna go back to something that you said earlier about um, be a big boy, right? Um, and so Roll, I'm gonna kick this question over to you first, then I'm gonna ask, uh, circle back to Pastor Mike. Um, and I'm going to ask for the, uh, the screen to be shown right now with the uh, flyer for uh, Ring the Alarm. So if you can just put that up for me. Um, Roll, would you like to share a little bit about where we were yesterday in D.C. Um, and why we came together? Um, that's the part one. And then part two... Um, Pastor Mike, you served on the committee for the Congressional Black Caucus, and um, you all published a report a few years ago called Ring the Alarm, The Crisis of Black Youth Suicide. Um, and so we're going to go to Raw and then back over to Pastor Mike and then Dr. Hankson if you want to add a few words. Thank you, Dr. Green. So the American Psychiatric Association Foundation is the charitable and educational arm of the American Psychiatric Association. It's a 180-year-old organization. It is a medical organization that hosts uh, 38,000 plus members across the United States and about 100 countries around the world. They're all medical doctors who specialize in psychiatry. And so as part of their charitable arm, 501c3, the mission and vision of the APA Foundation is to advance a mentally healthy nation for all where we live, learn, work, worship, and pray. And what we do as 
the foundation is bring thought leadership because a metal, mental health condition is a health condition, like the water we drink, like the air we breathe, like the food we eat. If you have any health condition, you wouldn't think twice if you can get to a doctor if it's that serious about getting to a medical doctor. Dr. Sidney Hankerson is a medical doctor who specializes in issues of the mind. And so yesterday, we were granted uh, some funds by Alchemies to launch a project we call the My Brother's Keeper Project. And it is around suicide in the black community with the emphasis on our young men and boys, largely from the age of 12 to 29 years old. And we brought together uh, representatives from the White House, we brought together uh, representatives from Health and Human Services Federal Agency, we had medical doctors in the room who were psychiatrists, some who were not, we had social workers like Dr. Green, who came all the way down to DC yesterday and ran back up here to host our conversation today. Uh, we had some uh, community activists, and all of us were grappling with the issues of how do, two questions. One, if I'm an African-American black boy, can I make it to 30? And we talked to you all about the journeys we had getting to where we were, uh, at least in two of those instances. I'm not sure how old you were in your fourth year of medical school, but certainly, Pastor Mike, you and I, we're not 30 years old when we went through our early challenges. And then because of our physical situations, if I can make it to 30, am I going to live to see 60? And the, and the good doctor started this show by asking us, get to a doctor early so we don't have to, we can do preventative things so we don't have to do uh, triage for emergency things, right? And so if we're struggling to make it to 30 because the weight is too heavy, but then what we've seen through statistics, Dr. Green, if you cut me open on the cusp of 59 years old next Wednesday, and you go down to the Mississippi Delta and you get a guy who works in the field, or you go up north to Michigan, Ohio, somewhere and get a guy on the plant, say we all born on the same day in February of 1965, if you cut us open and we African-American men, all our insides exactly the same. Doesn't matter about our zip code, doesn't matter what, whether we had uh, formal education or not, all of that stress, all of that strain, all of that racism, all of that imposter syndrome, all those microaggressions, all adds up into the crock pot of what it means to be a black man and boy. And so what we were trying to do is launch the first step. The second step is to have conversations like these. But what we wanna do is create a playbook at the end of it. And we want to have an online and an in-hand playbook where not only men and boys, but also the women and others who love us have access to that playbook. And it's like, okay, in this situation, it looked like it's third down for Hankerson. It's a mile to go. What plays can I call for him? What tools, what tips, what resources might be available? And we want them to be culturally created, Pastor Mike and curated, because if it doesn't relate to you, it don't matter what the plays are, right? You're not trying to hear what I'm trying to say. You're not understanding my situation. We want to do it, so what we're doing is going to bring the voice of community into development of the playbook so that you're going to tell us as community members what kind of offense or defense or special teams you have so we can design the plays around you, not the other way around. No cookie cutter. It's got to be plays that's going to work for you. Yeah. Pastor Mike, before you answer the question around um, what you think is contributing to the mental health challenges of black men and boys, um, I want to know from the audience if there are any young men in here under the age of 25. And if you are, can you stand up? We just want to see you. Under the age of 25. Y'all clap it up for these boys. There are about four or five of them in here. I wish there were more, um, because I think if they can hear these conversations early on, that we might be able to stem some of this. Thank you, guys. Pastor Mike? First of all, clearly, Raw is getting ready for the Super Bowl this Sunday <laughs> with those football analysis. But um, so some years ago with the Ring the Alarm, the uh, advisory group, 
for the congressional uh, uh, attempt or really engagement with this issue. It started really uh, with a good friend of mine, the now dean of the School of Social Work at NYU, Dr. Michael Lindsay, a good friend, classmate of mine from college. And my dean. Yeah, and your dean, yeah. And we were on a panel together. This is when, we, when I was really stepping into this mental health um, to really, as a church, trying to be part of these conversations. And one night, and this is something we don't hear, and he said a statistic, Raw, that shook me and shattered me in ways I can't imagine. He said the highest rates of suicide at that time may still be the case in the country. Yes, were black boys from the age of 5 to 13. The highest rates of suicide. That, and, and, and I started thinking when he said that, I was on the panel, I was stuck because I had never heard that data before. And I could not imagine, I went back immediately to myself at, at that young age and thought about, was that even a word I knew, suicide? And I was so taken, and so this task force was started, and we heard testimonies from parents and mothers. I remember this one, I don't know if you saw it, Sydney, there was this one mother who said she came home from work one day and found her six-year-old son in his closet. He had hung himself. At six, took a belt and tied it to the, 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 the beam, the post that hanging his clothes on in the closet, and, and hung himself at six years old. Why? And this is one of the contributing factors. Because he was being bullied, but the bullying, and see, this is a whole, several conversations from this, but the bullying wasn't just relegated to school. He had a phone social media, and the bullying was not, when we went to school back in the days and you got bullied, you dealt with it at school, and you went home. You dealt with it at school, you went home. But now, it follows you everywhere you go through the phone, and you got children. So one thing that's coming out now is a conversation, I think one of the contributing factors for young people is social media, without a doubt, and not just young people. With all of us, the impact of social media that reinforces feelings of unworthiness, of inadequacy that we have all the time. When you're constantly being told you're not enough or being buying into images, we look at children and say, oh man, they're gullible, they can be easily influenced. No, brother, if you're sitting there thinking somehow that your worth is connected to buying Gucci or something else that you see, or you want to live a certain life, popping bottles, and you scroll through Instagram, everybody look like they're living their best life, and you start thinking what I need to do to try to give the appearance that all is well, that is a problem. And so when I saw that thing about young boys, it, it blew my mind, and it really helped me understand that the work we do around mental health, around faith, has to begin at a young age. And we, we have to begin to create alternative narratives to the narrative that we know. What is it? The narrative around trauma, the narrative around generational trauma, the narrative around trauma that is embedded in the DNA of black men constantly, not just, well, black, all black people, black men in particular, this kind of emasculating trauma, that this dehumanizing trauma we find all the time, finding ourselves having to navigate things that people don't have to navigate, right? And so I think it gets carried on, and then here's the problem. It gets two things, internalized and normalized. Once it is internalized and normalized, it is no longer an issue, it's just the way it is. I say this story all the time. There was a brother in my town, and um, I grew up in a town called Roosevelt on Long Island, and there was a brother we saw all the time. Nassau Road is the main street in our community, and this brother was walking up and down Nassau Road all the time. All the time, back and forth. We go from one town, town of Uniondale, through Roosevelt to Freeport and back all the time. We used to call him Walking Willie. Right? Walking Willie. There you go, Walking Willie. Walking Willie. We come to the store, Walking Willie. You see Willie? He almost had the same clothes on time. I mean, and brother was walking with purpose, hard, right? Every day. Walking Willie was such a part of the background of our community, nobody stopped to say, hey, is something wrong with Willie? We had normalized his behavior. Now that's one example. We normalized that behavior in our community. We normalized that behavior in our conversations. We don't address it, and it starts as children. But I would say one of the greatest contributors to children right now, young black boys, is not only that kind of internalized and normalized trauma, but 
but we have to check this social media. And I'll say this, and I'll be done. Isn't it amazing that the creators of the technology don't let their children use it? The, the creators of this technology won't let their children use it, but we let it babysit our children. We got to think about that. I mean, I just want to address this issue of suicide. Um, so, so first and foremost, um, you know, if, if there's anyone in this space tonight or listening online who may have come here because you felt like you were at wit's end and maybe you wondered if life was worth living, please speak to us at the end of this program. We can provide you help. We have an abundance of resources to help you. Why suicide is so critical to address is because having thoughts of suicide, wondering if life is worth living, having the thought of wanting to go to sleep and not wake up is one of the symptoms of clinical depression. And we often don't link the two. Right? Because we throw around the word depression, oh, I'm depressed, things that, you know, uh, I'm depressed because the Giants were terrible this year, the Jets, you know. We, we <laughs> Pastor Mike, a huge Jets fan. But we, 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 we throw this around so much that we lose the significance of it. But having thoughts of suicide is actually one of the symptoms of depression. And so I think it's critical that as black men that we know that and that we realize that as men, instead of acknowledging sometimes that we may be feeling down or sad, when we get depressed, we often withdraw. We pull back. We lose interest in hobbies or activities that we would normally engage in. And sometimes we get irritable, right? So that is how depression looks different or in exhausted. men. Or exhausted. That's how depression looks different in, in men than it does in, in women and in the general population. And just one more thing about this intersection of suicidality and depression, especially for us because men often bury our feelings and just grinding and push through, right? That's where kind of the cycle of the, the bottle, right? The pills can begin. And it creates a cycle that we don't often talk about. And I think that tonight we are here to, to lift the veil off of that silence and really have the conversation and be real about, brother, are you, what are you doing when everybody leaves your apartment? What do you do in the quiet hours of the night? What do you do in the quiet hours of the morning? And so we are here to be able to provide resources. We'll talk a little bit about some of those resources in a, in a little bit, but just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware if you came here tonight in search of help and support, you came to the right place, and we have resources for you. Thank you, Dr. Angusson. And when you all came in, um, you would notice that there are vendors outside. Um, those vendors are here for you all, specifically focusing on men's mental health. And so I encourage you all to please stop by the tables, talk to the folks who are there, take the information. If it's not for you, then share it with someone else. Put it in your pocket, keep it there. Um, until you check in on someone and they may need it. Um, so I'm going to go off script for a second because we talked a little bit about so social media. And I think one of the things that are really important um, is what we see, right? Um, and I run a suicide prevention program here uh, at FCBC. They meet um, pretty consistently. It's called Thrive um, through the Hope Center. And we specifically focus on coping skills. Um, and one of the things that I, that I talk to them about um, is about being mindful and careful of what they take in, right? What they listen to, what they see, um, all of those things. And so um, I want to give a shout out, and I'm going to ask you to grab the mic. Uh, my brother over here, Dr. Brandon Frame, um, who started The Black Man Can. And so, Brandon, I'm just going to ask you to grab the mic for a moment. I know I'm putting you on the spot. Um, but just share with us uh, briefly, if you can do it in 30 seconds, um, to share a little bit about your organization and why you started it and some of your work that you're doing with black boys. I'll give it up for Brandon. Dr. Frame. 
Good evening, um, Dr. Brandon Frame, founder of the Black Man Can. The Black Man Can is a nonprofit organization focused on amplifying, creating, and curating spaces, programs for black men and boys. In terms of why it started, um, I went to Morehouse, shout out Morehouse, um, and, um, but also down in Atlanta, on the east side of Atlanta, like most communities, if you live on one side of the city, you never go to another side of the city. So if you live on the east side, you don't go to the south side and whatnot. And so we had brought boys to Morehouse. And um, afterwards, we did a debrief. We had this really great day experiencing it. Um, and then when we did the debrief, the young men um, after, when he said, how was the day? He loved it. But he said the only other place that he could think of that was like Morehouse was prison. And when asked to elaborate, he said he couldn't think of another place with 3,000 black men at one place at one time. And this was a fifth grader. And so that was the impetus for starting the Black Man Can. And we've been doing it for 14 years and have programs in schools and merch and all these different things. So it's, you know, thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. Good. I just want to share something. I've shared this story at FCBC before very quickly. Because when we hear suicide, we don't always have, I don't know if that's a wrap up music. Y'all hear that music? Yeah, we do hear their music. I got some music playing, some jazz music. I don't mind the background, though. <laughs> so, um, because sometimes we think of, we hear people who've, who've, who've uh, experienced death by suicide, and, and we can't imagine how it can happen. We, we hear stories, we hear the news reports, we can't imagine. And I asked Dr. Green, can I share be, what happened to me, and very briefly, because what I realized is that the difference between someone who actually goes through with um, an attempt at suicide from ideation is a subtle move. It just doesn't take a long time because you can have the, the ideation and the attempt at the same time and it can just be a moment that shifts it. I was in Seattle, Washington. I was on my sabbatical I do every three years, which I'm now changing to every other year. And I was in Seattle, excited to be my first time in Seattle. I was like, the air is crisp. I got to the hotel. I was like, this is going to be a great time away. It was like my second week into my 40-day sabbatical. And I knew I had these kind of feelings. I, I now know they were depression. I was feeling wild pastoring, preaching depressed, teaching depressed, counseling depressed. We don't all talk about functional, being functional with your depression and your anxiety. I'm in the hotel room. I was on the 22nd floor. There was a balcony. I opened the door to the balcony to look at an amazing view I had in Seattle. And remember, there had been no ideations before. There's nothing. I step out on the balcony. I look out, and I'm excited about being there. And I heard a voice say to me like I'm sitting. It said, you know if you jump, you can survive. That's what I heard. If you jump, you'll survive. Go ahead. You can make it. I felt a force pull me back into that room. And I fell on this ground, and it was for, for hours, and I kid you not, I was balled up like in fetal position, crying for hours, because I didn't know what had just happened. I had never heard a voice before like that. I never felt that before. I never in my life thought about the idea of jumping off of a balcony 22 stories up. But but in that moment, it was so subtle and so convincing that all that needed to be was a little opening in my mind to say, hey, I can do it. Because at the end of the day, we were sitting here when we told us ask what our superhero was, we all said Superman, right? And I thought about that, how that instant of an idea planted in your mind that I could survive 22 stories if I jumped. Now, if I had done it and yielded, it would have been a whole narrative now. Because everybody would have said, what? I had no idea Pastor Mike was dealing with that. I had no idea he was going through that. Why? Because most of us, all of us, especially men and especially black men, we continue to suffer in silence and don't say anything until we feel absolutely, positively broken. And then at that time, it's crisis. So I had to share that to put a real face to that idea for me because it, it, I will never forget that day, but it is a day that reminds me that if it had not been for God that day, in my mind, getting me, I know I would not be here. I know I would not be here. So I had to say that, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna kick this question over to Dr. Hankerson. Um, 
because you really focus on ways to engage faith-based communities around access to mental health care. Can you talk a little bit about that work? Sure. Um, so first of all, uh, my faith is just my guiding light. And I grew up in, in the black church, the black Baptist church. My dad went to Morehouse, a bunch of Morehouse men, you know, here tonight. Um, and, you know, it was the kind of church where you started service at 11 and you came out at like 3. And then you had the, the, the meals where you put in the white containers and then you went back for another service. Uh, so I grew up in the church um, and knew the power of the black church. But as I started uh, becoming interested in psychiatry, I heard many a pastor not telling Pastor Mike's story, but saying, the only Prozac you need is Jesus. Or we, you need to, we're too blessed to be stressed. Or we as a people are too anointed to be disappointed. Right? So these kind of knee-jerk reactions that contributed to folks suffering in silence. And we know that in our community, when folks are struggling with mental health conditions, with depression, anxiety, they go talk to their, their ministry leaders. They go talk to their deacons. They go talk to their pastor. And so our churches, our faith leaders, are really frontline mental health professionals. So we have uh, really just partnered with churches throughout the city to train uh, men and other community health workers within the church to be able to identify folks who may be struggling with symptoms of depression or anxiety, provide them free, I'll say that again, free counseling, and then if they need additional support to connect them to places like the Hope Center or other mental health professionals to get care. So we just want to show a quick video of some of that work now to really emphasize the power of the role of the church and other community-based organizations. It features Pastor Mike, uh, but we can uh, play that video now. Depression is a clinical condition that is the number one cause of disability in the world. It's also the number one cause of disability in New York City. So our team conducted the first ever study where we identified people with depression in the church. We worked with three different churches, one in Harlem, one in Brooklyn, and one in Queens. And across these three churches, where we screened over 100 people 20%, one out of five people at these three churches had depression. One of the things that Dr. Hankerson and I have done is that uh, we have created a community health worker training institute, uh, or center rather, at Columbia University. My name is Calvin Martin. I'm a community health worker. I was trained by Columbia University Medical Center, which is a part of New York Presbyterian Hospital. The training was long and intense. It was an eight weeks training course, three days a week, two to three hours per day. The role of the church in the black community has historical significance. It has been a place of solace, comfort, a place for guidance and spiritual wellness for generations. Over 70% of African-Americans attend church regularly. And this community health worker training center that we have is responsible for working directly with health ministries in the black church and imparting skills and knowledge around different health screening activities, around different health counseling activities, and even around the enrollment of congregants into health insurance plans. What they've been able to do at Columbia and with community health workers are form a network of support and care and concern that's been able to help countless people but we cannot afford to remain silent. We cannot afford to remain embarrassed. We must seek out the services that are available from the institutions that are committed, but I'm committed to the healing that is necessary to keep my mind and my heart right, and my spirit right, and my soul right. So we, we want to give everyone here the opportunity to um, really just kind of test your stress level or measure your mood, right? The first part of healing is to kind of check in with yourself emotionally. So if you could just take a few minutes, uh, we have a brief survey uh, that you could take either 
via your phone. Here's a QR code if you want to pull out your phone, take a picture, do the, do the survey, or we can do the, the survey uh, in the back on your way out with, uh, on paper. It'll take about five minutes, literally. You'll put in your name, uh, email, even if you don't have time to finish it tonight, we can reach out to you. But this survey will really um, let you check in with yourself, check your stress level, and if you are currently experiencing symptoms of anxiety, if you're currently experiencing symptoms of, of depression or elevated stress, then you could meet with one of our community health workers. We have a group of brothers who are here tonight. You all could just kind of stand and, or raise your hands. Uh, they're kind of in the, in the back and in the, in the back over there. Um, who can meet with you, who can provide free counseling and supports, help you identify, hey, you know, I, I'm still, I'm struggling with uh, paying my rent or I'm, I'm struggling for, with job search or whatever the case may be. Um, our community health workers are here and can provide you that access to that free counseling. And I just want to thank Pastor Mike for his leadership and partnership with this initiative uh, because this is something that we are trying to really roll out across, across the city. And I just want to echo that, um, you know, here uh, uh, our motto at FCBC is live, love, serve. And um, we are not interested in just having the conversation about mental health and what's going on and what's happening. We are really here to serve you. We are really here to support you um, and be a shoulder for you, but most importantly, get you connected to culturally based, culturally inclusive, free services in your own community where there are folks who look like you who can support you. Okay. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna start this question off with uh, Mr. Andrews, but um, the question is really for all of you. Each of you are members of a black fraternity. It just worked out that way, everybody. And so my question to all of you, and you can share what fraternity you're in, um, is how can fraternities and other civic organizations be engaged or encouraged to support um, specifically the mental health of black men and boys? Mr. Andrews. So diamonds are a girl's best friend. So. <laughs> Cap Alpha Psi. So all of the fraternities, and I'll only speak for Kappa, uh, have a uh, child development mentorship program, whether that's Kappa League, which celebrated 100 years last year through the Guide Right program. And uh, Guide Right and Kappa League uh, work with uh, middle school and high school uh, young boys around development issues. You know, in the 20th century, it would have been home economics related. Uh, but how do you navigate uh, being uh, a diamond in the rough, as we like to say, so that you could be polished uh, when you come through? Uh, and then as we matriculate through uh, college, uh, there is the uh, undergraduate leadership conference. And so it, it deals with health, wealth, and self when we look at these programs. And so whole health, that's mental and physical health. You know, when it turns to uh, the, the uh, wealth, you know, not only about wealth creation, but money management, trying to do uh, Greeks learning to avoid debt, those kind of things. So don't get hooked into credit cards when you don't have any income before you even get started and end up uh, with your student debt plus some credit debt. And now you never going to get out of a hole, right? So these are the kind of programs. So one of the things I think we can do you know, is to further amplify that those programs even exist because a lot of times if you haven't been in the black Greek culture, you, you may not even know the difference in crimson and cream or black and gold or purple and gold or whatever it is, blue and white. Uh, but the reality of it is Kappa League is not just for the, the sons of Kappa men. Guide right is not just for the sons of Kappa men. And then we have, uh, just through our grand poll mark, just launched the R-U-O-K movement. And uh, so the APA Foundation is in consultation to see how our My Brother's Keeper would be further aligned with work like the R-U-O-K movement. So I'm a member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. And um, it's interesting, thank you. All right, I see the bros out here. Um, 
One of the things I think all organizations can do is that an important part of our organization is the idea of mentoring, right? One of our cardinal principles are that, that shape us, the principles that drive us is not just manhood, but Christian manhood. And when we think about manhood, right? We always have the opportunity through our mentoring programs to really define what that means. And, and oftentimes, especially the programs I've been a part of, redefining manhood is critical because it begins with conversations about vulnerability and transparency, right? That is critical, and I think all the organizations, whatever the fraternity is, we all have mandates to mentor, mandates to serve, mandates to empower the next generation. And I think that's one of the things we constantly push is reimagining what manhood is, which f f feeds right into this conversation. But I think it often has to do with how we, how we speak about vulnerability and transparency and have these conversations with our young people. You see, what I realize is that part of the reason, for example, I went to college is because a, a, a mentor, a counselor in an at-risk program started pouring into me about school why school is important. I ignored him for a long time, but he kept planting seeds. I said that because if we begin to have these conversations, imagine now all of us in here who are connected to our children, our nephews, you know, our, our grandchildren, if we start talking to them about vulnerability, about being honest, about not being ashamed to cry in public, not being ashamed to be real and authentic in public, if we start those conversations with young men, then they grow up to be adults who replicate that and pass that on. I did that with my son. My son is 32 years old, and my son saw his father crying, saw his father vulnerable, and he also saw what it was to see your dad suffer and still be your hero. Struggle and still be your hero. Hurt and still be your hero. And I tell you this, I don't often talk about this because I get emotional, but those are seeds I was intentional about planting in my son, right? So he could understand, forget these arbitrary false ideas of what it means to be a man. You watch your father in a sick bed and still be a man. On my back and still be a man. So it doesn't matter. And I had another moment when I was sick, Dr. Green, a moment, this is right before I experienced a bout of sepsis. I was extremely sick. And I had one of the most profound moments in my life. We lived in a place at the time, there were three floors in the house and I was in the third floor. I could not get out the bed. I could not walk to get down the stairs to the hospital. My son put me on his back and carried me down the steps to get to the door so I, he could take me to the hospital. I, that was the most powerful thing, but in that moment, in that moment, he didn't see a man who was ashamed, or a man who was weak, he saw a father in need, his dad. And so he did that, and he never, never. So my son, what, I, what I've shown my son and taught my son is that if you're a man, you better cry sometimes. If you're a man, you better be honest about when you hurt. If you're a man, you better get to the doctor, right? So that's what we do, and that's what I think we all do. These organizations have the capacity. We have the capacity, because so many young men idolize us. They look up to us in these organizations. We can actually reimagine manhood for, for, for young boys. I think that's critical. So I, I'm a brother of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and, uh, all right, Brandon and others. <laughs> um, you know, one of our signature programs, especially my, my, my chapter uh, program from, from college, was we would mentor uh, kids in elementary school. And I just think about the power of a, a black man in college connecting with a third, fourth, and fifth grader, a little boy, and thinking about a lot of these kids even though they, I went to school at the University of Virginia, it, it was like, that was for them, it was somewhere over there. They never imagined going to UVA. That was something that white folks did. And so to see a group of black men currently enrolled in college and, and playing with them, hanging out with them, asking how they felt, modeling for them what we felt and being real about that uh, was powerful. And so I think that I, I completely agree with you, Pastor Mike, that one of the things that we all can do is, is be mentors um, and model for the next generation and folks in our, in our age group 
who, who don't <laughs> express themselves authentically and who, who are hiding behind that mask of masculinity that so many of us believe that we have to put on every day, modeling what our authentic truth is each and every day. Um, and so another thing that we focus on really is, is health equity and really engaging the community about that. Um, you know, our focus is on mental health today, but another thing that I think we as, as black men don't talk about also is prostate cancer, right? That's a, another silent killer in our community and has its own stigmas, you know, associated with it. And this is a powerful issue that the intersection of mental health and cancer, especially prostate cancer, every man in my family, every man, both sides of my family have had prostate cancer, everyone. And so for me, this is, you know, and, and for, for our fraternity, issues around equity and making sure that we as a people have access to healthcare services that are timely, that are appropriate, and that are accessible, accessible and that speak our language in ways that we can connect with as black men is something that uh, we are passionate about and I think that we all need to leave here passionate and committed to. Thank you for that. Um, and you don't have to be in a fraternal organization or any other organization to be a mentor or be a role model, right? Um, and oftentimes we think about it in terms of the folks who are younger than us. But what about the brother who lives down the hall from you? What about the guy that you see every day on your way to work, right? It costs us nothing to ask a question. Um, it costs us nothing to be kind. Um, or to acknowledge another person, right? And so that, that role model, that mentorship can come in, in many forms. Um, I wanna be mindful of our time. Um, and I wanna say thank you to all of you for being here and for staying, because you're still here. Um, so please give it up for yourselves. <laughs> and I wanna give you all an opportunity to ask uh, our panelists some questions. Um, and so we're gonna take a few questions from the audience members. I'm gonna ask uh, Deacon Darnell and Deacon Victor. Um, if you need another mic, I'm happy to share mine with you. But if there are a couple of questions from the audience, um, and then um, I'm gonna kick it back over to Pastor Mike for um, a special uh, inquiry. So um, if there are any questions here that you'd like to, if anybody has a question um, that they wanna ask the panelists, um, I'm gonna ask you to just come up to the middle aisle uh, really quickly where you are, either to your left or to your right. Um, grab the mic, um, and there you go. Okay. Are go for it. Um, I have a, first, I, I, I've learned that men are emotional and secure. Um, thanks. I ain't used to this, Vic. Um, I'm one of those men that are Take your time. Um, we used to talk about superheroes, and um, I called myself the invisible man. Because when I was going through something, I don't want you to see me. I don't want to see myself. Um, I was scared to, I was scared of suicide but I wasn't scared of being by myself. And I didn't know how to ask for help. I was one of those that, like, I need help, and I'll help you. And I still don't know how to ask for help. So how do me as a black man ask for help when you're so used to helping others? You know what I mean? Because Yeah. yeah, so I'll respond this way. I don't, I'm not a person who gives prescriptions like here are the three things you do to learn how to ask for help. But here's what I will say. I think you're not the only one in that position here tonight where you justify self-neglect by helping others. 
In other words, you make it so noble to help everybody else that you use your capacity to pour in and help others to justify why you don't help yourself, right? We do that all the time. We let that be the excuse, right? In that way, we don't feel as guilty. And what happens is it gets to a point where our capacity to pour out is no longer there for us. Because you, you, you give and you give until you want to eat and there's nothing left for you. And because you spent so much time trying to help other people, you don't know what is the route to get your own help. Because the one who helps everybody else isn't amazing, sometimes makes a connection between weakness and support. And so you don't do it. And so the first thing I think, one of the things you do is recognize, one, it's okay not to be okay all the time. Because part of that myth of being the hero, because you say you're the invisible man, but you also had this idea that you had to be the superhero for other people. When you feel you gotta show up for other people, and, but you neglect yourself. One, it's okay not to be okay. Because the truth is, no one will really effectively measure you by you performing wellness. To perform like you're okay, right? That's one. Two, you already know how to, to do what you need done. You know why? Because it took courage to stand up and say what you just said. So, the same courage it took, think about it. You say you have a hard time asking for help, but you stood up in this crowded sanctuary tonight with people you don't know and you admitted you struggled. You already won. So that means, the next level is to continue the courageous clarity and honesty. Because here what you just did tonight, you got a room full of brothers who now know you need help. And so you already did it. You just said, how do I do it while you were doing it? So as they said here tonight, we got resources here for you. You're not going to just come in here and talk. There are resources. There are therapists here. There are people here who can help. And don't leave this place tonight without tapping into what is right here. Because watch this. When you're hungry, you don't try to eat, you eat. If you're hurting, don't try to get help, get it. It's here tonight. Don't leave here without doing it, all right? I'm just going to push it a little further that I'm going to ask that somebody in here be accountable for you tonight, brother. One person. Okay? You'll get it. Thank you for your courage in stepping up. The hardest step on a, on a journey for change, for progress, is the first step. And you took the first step. Now, the brother who oversees 988 for New York is right outside. If you go out this room and you turn to your left, he's right there on the corner. 988 has been around for almost two years. It's got a, a text and a chat feature. So yes, get you some help tonight, whether you on or offline, but when you the invisible man alone, and you're like, I don't know who I can reach out to, think about 988, it's free, it's, it's confidential. If you can't get to 988, we just launched the Mental Health Care Works campaign. It is the first uh, mental health literacy and awareness campaign that doesn't use the term stigma anywhere. MentalHealthCareWorks.org talks about what stigma really is, particularly in our community, fear. We heard a little about fear tonight. Shame. We talking about a little bit about shame tonight and discrimination. And if somebody was discriminated against in the FCBC family, Pastor Mike, I want to think the whole congregation would be up on their feet saying, we're not going to take that discrimination. So don't, we're not going to be discriminated against. So 988 is there. you got people around you here. But mentalhealthcareworks.org is all there for everybody where you can see some of those early tools, tips, and resources. In the first 100 days of mentalhealthcareworks.org, 35 million people tapped in to that website. Yeah. As of December 31st, 2023, over 55 million people had tapped in. 70 million as of today. Y'all out there asking for the help. 
you can be the next. Come on in, and let's get the help we need. Julius, do me a favor. Um, ask two people from the Hope Center team to go to the 988 table, get the stickers, and start handing them out now, please. Thanks so much. Okay, my name is I am with an organization called the Circle of Brothers. I also am part of a men's group. We have a Zoom that we do every Wednesday. And we are building a men's group at a place called The Haven. Uh, what I want to get to is somebody mentioned that the young, uh, young boy hung himself. Uh, he was six years old, I believe. Right? Yes. And yes. he hung himself. So it made me think about, we have an upcoming program that we're going to do, and it's a Solution and Survival Summit for young, young people. So it made me think about something like, uh, what's up with the bully? What's up with the bully? And what we want to do is to help teach young people how to navigate the bully. How do we navigate that? How do we get around that violence and you know how, that negativity? How do we navigate it? You know. So uh, that's all I want to say. And thank you for being here. And I hope to speak to each one of you because I do. A thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Can all right. Next. Next question. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Just a quick question. Um, how do we bring in the preteens and the high schoolers in this conversation? You know, because we're here and obviously we're all adults for the most part, you know, like four or five, that's under 25. But, you know, two of the panelists today spoke about their struggles as a child and that has been ongoing basically. And so, how do we address it? How do we bring in parents into this conversation? Yeah, Dominic, thank you for that question. Um, so one resource Dr. Green has mentioned in terms of the Thrive program, which is focused you know, on youth. Um, I recently got two separate grants that are really focused on addressing the needs of the entire family and working with kids 13 through 19. And the one that we're doing with black boys, we're gonna be implementing in YMCA basketball leagues and boys and girls clubs. Because we know for a lot of brothers, sports is everything. And sports are, provide community, sports provide you know, access, and sports can provide supports. But in many times, sports um, creates the, the, the antithesis of what we're trying to create tonight in terms of being authentic, in terms of being vulnerable, in terms of being able to ask for help like this brother courageously did. So we have a program called Brothers Connect I'm happy to connect with, with you, Dominic, and any other brother that is interested in learning more and wanting to get your, the kids 13 and 19 plugged into this program. Yeah, yeah I, I think in addition to the, the, the myriad of programs that we have, I think we have to be aggressive. I, I, I mean, when we say young people, we all know young people. We all know some young boy or some young teenager who can, who can benefit from our contact, right? We have to be aggressive about that. I mentioned this brother who saved my life at 14, right? And I never forget when I, when he first, when I got into this program and he came, I was so hardcore. I told, I told his brother I was going to shoot him legitimately because I, Think about this, I couldn't handle him speaking so positive to me because I wasn't used to that. And my reaction was to be violent. But here's what it is, sustained engagement. That man never let me go for four years. He kept, every time he saw me, every time I came to the program after school, he kept pouring into me, kept pouring into me. I remember, Brian, when I was part of Operation Alternative, they, they took us one day and got us some uh, suits Got us, got us suits, and we went to the caucus weekend. I had never done anything like that. I didn't want to go because it wasn't cool, but I went because it was this program. There's this girl who was going I like, and so I was like, 
I'm going. And it opened me up to an experience that I never thought was possible for me because he never stopped. He never stopped pouring into me. He never stopped trying to pull me in. And sometimes we go to some young man and we get a negative reaction, we let it go. We got to be aggressive and sustain our engagement young people because we all know people like that who will get lost in the street, lost in the process, and we have the opportunity to make that difference. We know people like that. There's some out here in the street right now who come by this church all the time. We have that capacity. So we have to do that work. Thrive does it you know, in a formal way, but we can do it informally by just engaging brothers we see all the time, young men around here within the church and outside of the church. Brother Rawls gonna answer the question, um, and then we're gonna take these last two questions before we go into the last thing. All right. At, at the end of Three. 2023, okay. the Got APA it. Foundation received nationwide authorization uh, from the uh, federal government to put our Notice Talk Act at school program in every K-12 high school and elementary school and middle school in the country for free. So if you got kinfolk in K-12 and your school doesn't have Notice Talk Act, you need to go ask them why. The class only takes two and a half hours. You don't have to give up a whole school day. Notice, we're gonna notice the signs and symptoms when our young folk are in trouble or in distress. Talk, we're gonna be better active listeners and then ACT is gonna give those tools, tips and resources and then, uh, Dr. Green, when we get to uh, pass Notice Talk Act and this Notice Talk Act at school movement, I think when we do part three of this conversation, we're going to have to activate some of these young brothers on the stage with us. Absolutely. That's how it's going to do it. Yeah. All right. Um, we're going to go to our next question, and I'm just going to ask um, that as you ask your question, that you be as succinct as possible. Yes. Okay. Um, as a son um, who recently started taking therapy and seeing the changes um, in myself in the past six months, um, and I, uh, I want to be able to talk to my father, um, who I, I know needs it. So how do you begin to have that conversation? Um, yeah. Yeah. So you heard that? He said he started therapy, and you know your dad needs it. I think... Um, it's a difficult conversation, right? Especially as a son, right? And it's funny because I'm in this space right now. And I think that the way you begin the conversation is from a place of love and a desire to see. Because oftentimes, for me, the contributing factor to my own mental health issues was parenting issues from my father, right? So, so being able to, in love, just have a conversation. It can't be this, Dad, I'm in therapy, I think you need it. It can't be that. It is to begin to have conversations about the discoveries you've had in therapy, right? And in, the, and in a way where you're not trying to push your dad into therapy, but you're just sharing your experience. See, when you share your experience in transparency, right, that's like in the scriptures, where Jesus tells a parable of the sower, what you're doing is sowing a seed in your father. You're, you're taking that courageous step to sow a seed in your father by sharing your story, sharing even your pain, and sharing how your journey has evolved and the growth and the transformation you've experienced. And you do it in a way that's loving, that demonstrates compassion, but at the same time, compassionately and lovingly be unrelenting in the conversation. Keep having it. Because one day, your father just may say to you, well, who's the therapist you go to see? But you have to just start there and trust it. Trust. That's the other thing. Trust that if you do that part, it'll come about. And the last thing I'll add is be persistent and patient. Because you know as men, it, the first time we hear that, we're like, oh, I don't need, I'm not going to mold my sons doing that. That's okay. But just keep pouring into how therapy is changing you and then be patient and persistent. Thank you for your question. Next up. Yeah, good evening. I'm, uh, my name is John, and um, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you. And, uh, plus, I'm an ex-Marine and a retired police officer. Always fancied myself a tough guy. I'm 65 years old. 
I finished my 12th session in the Hope Center, in the Hope Center today. Mm. The Hope Center <laughs> saved my life. Yeah. And probably saved a lot of lives because I was going through so much trauma, okay, that I never thought I would come to the point of suicide, but I was there twice. I did not let it be a third time. I agonized over asking for help, of going to the Hope Center. Help Center. I got in an Uber. I wanted to turn around and go back home. I could not bear my soul like that, but I didn't want to go to a third time of having to try to talk myself out of suicide. Mm -hmm. I went anyway. I sat with my counselor. I cried unabashedly sometimes. I was angry sometimes. Everything came out. It was the hardest thing in my life I had to do, mm. and it turned out to be the most important and best thing I ever did. <laughs> brother, if you need help, my brothers, get that help, man, I'm telling you. It's the best thing that I did for myself, okay? And I had the resources, I had everything I could to, to hurt myself and others and whatnot. And I, I was there twice. I did not let it happen a third time. And today, today was my last day with my counselor. And I'm seeking further counseling or whatnot. I know I'm, I'm a work in progress and I'm gonna be healing for the rest of my life. Mm. What I found out through my counseling and whatnot, okay, was I had problems with, with alcohol and drugs and everything. I managed to get through a career in the, uh, in the police department and through the um, Marine Corps, okay? But my thing now is to help somebody, to let you know that we as men, okay, it's difficult. It was hard for me to go to the help center, believe me. It was hard for me to sit there and cry, okay, in front of a stranger or whatnot. I'm fighting back the tears right now because I'm so grateful. The first thing I did when I came in, I saw Pastor Mac, I, you, you were about to walk past me. I shook your hand, I said, my brother, Thank you for the work you're doing. That's from the heart, my man. Because I would not be here right now mm. if it wasn't for the whole center. Thank you. If it wasn't for the whole center. Get that up, my brother. Brother, thank you for sharing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I just want to highlight, and again, brother, thank you for sharing. We talked about the military and the fact that you were in the Marines. I was actually, uh, I, I, one day a week I'm at the Bronx VA and our vets are hurting. Every day, 17 veterans die by suicide. Every day, 17 veterans die by suicide. And we think about some of the, what triggers that. So much of it is the trauma they experienced in the service the unresolved trauma from the communities from which they came and the, their family. So brother, for you to stay here and talk about the help that you got from the Hope Center is powerful. I definitely wanna connect with you and just the message again for any brother who may be struggling tonight, you can meet with one of our community health workers for free. Like we are providing free counseling and connections to the Hope Center. So everyone here can walk away with access to free services. So thank you for that. Good evening. Uh, my name is born and raised in Brooklyn. My sister gave me the flyer for tonight. I listen to you all speak about young men in school, and I know it's like MBK, they deal with a lot of the children that are in school from a particular age, from 13 to 19. Spanning the five decades that I've been on this earth, all our men need help. I'm here because I want to know, I have an organization called B'nai Bina, Children of Understanding, to where those children that are taken from homes, placed into the prison system, placed into foster care. We don't have the mental capacity to help everybody, but we would like to be able to help a lot of them. And they make it to where it's broken up, to where you can only help this group here, and the other group gets left out. So those young men, I just lost my son, December 28th of 22, 28 years old. 
They took him from his mother. That's part of broken home. They didn't put him in the house with me. They took him and locked him up, not for a crime. Not for a crime whatsoever. But because they didn't believe that the mother could handle him. He ended up overdosing. Because he couldn't handle it. I tried to do everything with him. From putting him in boxing, putting him in everything to help him to strengthen his mind and his body. And I have six sons. And I try to work with every one of them. And I work with other people's children in the neighborhood, different states, out the country. And believe it or not, it's a, as they said, a war on drugs. This is, this here is an atrocity of what's going on with our children. And I came here to meet the individuals who can help us to help them. That's why I'm here. And I want to know what are you all doing with those that are incarcerated and let go, that are taken, that are in foster care. These are all young men. We, didn't, we, we haven't even spoken about the young women. This is just the young men. And between that young age of 5 to 12, you still got a chance to change their mindset. But the ones 13 to 19 are set. You can't really just easily talk to them. You have to show them more than you actually talk to them. Then they loosen up for you. That's what I would like to know. How can we do both at the same time? So since 2018, great question, powerful. Since 2018, I have worked in a program for reentry community members uh, at the Georgetown University in Washington. And one of the things we're hoping to do is take that program nationwide where we train uh, community members who return and to be paralegals. Because what we found out is that some of these uh, reentry community members know more about the legal system than the lawyers do. They've had a different relationship with it. And a lot of what we're talking about doing is how do we start not reinventing, not creating, but redefining our relationships with where we live, learn, work, worship, and play. And if we redefine it on our terms, in language that we understand, then they either gonna yield to us or they're gonna watch us win somewhere else, right? So we gotta redefine it. So I'd love to catch up with you so I can talk to you about the Georgetown program. It's the Prison and Justice Initiative at Georgetown and they got information online as well. And partnerships are key. Okay. Let, let me also say this. Sometimes the, the crisis that we face and the crises that we face, as you said, it's an atrocity, right? And what happens is, and, and I know this for a fact, we look at the enormity of the problem and we wonder, how can I fix it? How can I help it? Well, if you look at the enormity of the problem, you're gonna feel overwhelmed because it's daunting. And just as you said, when you help and you work, and in your work, you, you say, you feel, man, I wish I could do more, or this is not enough, or I'm only dealing with this limited population here, and there's so many young people, brothers, men and women who need our help from that age, and I know Dr. Hankerson talked about a program for that, and you feel overwhelmed, but you're passionate, and as a father, you're not just a father to your sons, you're a father to those who come in contact with you, right? Here's what I want to recommend, remind you of, and this is not to say how to do the work, remind you of this. Sometimes we don't realize you change the world by one person. One person, one person. If you can see the impact on one life, you don't know what that impact will have. I'll use myself as an example. At 14 years old, when I started in that program with that, with that counselor, there is no way I thought at 14 years old that I would be a pastor. No way I thought that I would be a preacher. No way I thought I would go to college, especially when my guidance counselor told me I wasn't college material. No way I could see that. But that man who poured into me is actually, was actually a preacher. He was in seminary at the time doing his field education in that program and he passes in Boston now. 
And I remember telling him not too long ago, I thanked him for what he did for me. I've been blessed in the work that I do. And what I'm about to say is not to show what I've done, but as a point to this. Thousands of people have come to this church. Thousands of people around the country, multiple, hundreds of thousands have been impacted by the work of this church, by this ministry. We've had people come here and talk about the impact of sermons from Scotland and Paris and everywhere, right? All these multiple thousands of people, this man just stopped me and taught me for the work you do, but watch this. Take the tens of thousands of people who've been impacted by this work, and you know how it happened? One man pouring into one boy and not realizing that one day that one boy would be doing this. That's how it happens. You don't know the impact of those young people you pour into. You probably will never see the final result of the trees you've been watering and planting. But you gotta believe in that and not feel overwhelmed by the nature of the issues you face but be committed to the people God has placed right in front of you to make an impact and go to bed feeling good at night. No, I didn't save the world, but I did save the world by that one person at a time. So don't forget that, brother. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to take our last question. All right. I performed in front of millions and spoke in front of thousands, and I'm nervous right now just because this is sensitive. Um, first and foremost, thank you. I've been a FCV, FCBC member for over a year and a half now. Um, it's been amazing. It's saved and changed my life. So first of all, thank you for this event. Um, I do have a two-part question. The first part is I'm looking for very strategic and specific tips for Brothers who I'm affiliated with, I've been in proximity with, I'm, I'm close with, I call them friends, I call them brothers, right? Um, who are absolutely depressed. There's no, you know, maybe. You know, there, there's two extremes because it's multiple. So over the last three years, I've lost, you know, four people that have unsubscribed from life, right? Through mental health issues. And um, it's something that, that impacts me, of course, obviously. It makes me feel helpless. And I'm looking for ways to be of more service and guidance and helping you know, the people that are in my life that I deeply care about because there's the extreme of you have someone that goes out every weekend, right? They're turning up every weekend. You know that's a problem, that's not normal, right? They're indulging in, in alcohol and, and smoking every single day. And then you have the other side of the fence, the other extreme that they're ju they just vanished, you know, they were around, you've seen them here and there, now you never see them anymore, no social media posts, very weird, you know, the red flags are clear, um, and I'm looking for ways to help them outside of the generic, you know, um, call this number and look for help, because realistically, not all men are going to be willing to do that, a lot of men are hard-headed, um, or, you know, that's just not something that might be suitable for them. And the second part of this question, and I apologize if I'm overstepping, um, the second part is, um, Pastor Mike, I really resonated with your balcony um, experience in ways that this question is not even going to, you know, come close to computing. And it's very strange because when in my life, I've, like everyone's life, life is volatile. You have your highs and your lows. And it's been weird where in situations where you do feel like you're on top of the mountain and that voice comes in out of nowhere anyway, I guess I'm looking for what kind of strategies or coping mechanism do you use or um, just in general if anybody has a, a, an answer for that to kind of limit that or I don't know if there's ever a way to just stop that completely because it's one of those things where life is good. I'm healthy, every, my family's great, there's no problems going on, it's just a routine, you know, and then that voice still comes out. It's very strange. And, you know, I don't know if it's a, a, a trauma that's passed genetically from my ancestors or if it's just because of the experiences that I've had in life when I was at my lows that I've never healed from or what does that look like. But I'm looking for ways to do my best effort to eliminate that voice. Those are my two questions. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Hankerson. Well, brother, I mean, you packed a lot in there. Um, I, I think first and foremost, you know, um, what's clear is that you 
care about your friends. And I think one thing that has come up tonight is that as men, we often don't get credit for being caretakers, right? Because we may not be caring specifically, primarily for parents or, or kids as the primary caretaker, but we do do a lot of caretaking for those in our network. And so I think, just like we told a young brother who wanted to get his father into therapy, I think what you have to do is for your friends, explain how your life is changing and explain the changes that you are making uh, to pursue health. And I think the second thing for you, if you are not currently seeing a therapist, I would encourage you to consider seeing one. Because when you are carrying that much from your friends, when you are processing that much, you've talked a lot about like your family history, you talked about Pastor Mike's uh, balcony experience and, and what that resonated for you, it seems like you are processing a lot. And so that is what a therapist can help you do. Provide a safe space that is your time, your space, to process things, to process situations in your time and in your way, and in a way that is, is best serving for you. So that's what I would say for you, brother. Thank you. I, I, I definitely agree with that. For me, right, there were so many layers that I had to kind of cut through to get the heart um, because all of our depression, all of our anxiety has an origin story, right? And getting to that, I don't think I would have ever navigated that journey without a therapist. When I started in 2000, well, 2011 and 2012, I was seeing a therapist every Monday and Friday, every week, twice a week, because I knew that what I was in, dealing with was so critical. The layers of trauma, the, the battling with past abuse, you name it, that I needed to do that. And, and it, again, it was life-changing and life-saving. And then I had to do things for myself that I started incorporating because what I realized is that most of us who live with trauma, we either live in two spaces. We either live in a past we're trying to get away from or a future we're trying to create. But we often don't stay in the present moment. If you think about, think about how much time during the day you actually give to being in the moment. Most of our thoughts talk, go back or they go forward. When you're sitting here now, Somebody's sitting there thinking about what I'm going to eat when I leave. <laughs> you thinking about what you're going to, what you're going to do when I leave, when this is over. You, and, and in that moment of thinking about what I'm going to do when I leave, you miss something in the present moment. So what I had to learn to do to be present with my present is to meditate. So I started this journey of studying about meditation, reading about meditation from various traditions, because some people think, one of the myths about, I think, how Christianity is, is that if you're a Christian, that means you can't learn anything else. If it ain't about Jesus, then it ain't holy. No, I study Buddhism and Hinduism and meditation practices from those traditions because unfortunately, we don't really have that as a tradition within Christianity. Even though the scriptures talk about meditate on the word day and night, we think it just means read the Bible. But meditation is actually part of our tradition. And I learned that. So I started really reading about meditation, watching videos on meditation, and then finding different teachers that I could attach to, some digitally, virtually, and some in, in person that I can attach to and learn from. And so now meditation is part of my life. It sometimes is formal. I have my meta right now in my office, under my desk, I have a travel meditation chair that sometimes I bring out in this sanctuary when nobody's here. I put it right here on the stage and I sit. I have one at home, right? I do the same thing. And that prayer, when you see these breeds, this ain't jewelry. Right? These are mala prayer beads, and they help me stay focused during my times of meditation. So I would encourage you, that's, that has been life-enhancing for me. It has calmed me down. 
It has helped me become more patient, right? And it has helped me to do one thing that we don't often do, brothers and sisters who are here. We don't always know how to be gracious with ourselves and compassionate towards ourselves and patient with ourselves. We don't always do that. So that's my recommendation. You know, we could talk more about it offline but, and direct you some ways, but meditation has been, has, has been salvific for me, life-changing. So thank you for that. And, and I want to, go ahead. I'll get you going, and I'll do it. Yeah. Um, so before we um, give our, our, our last few comments over, um, I want to remind you all again to please check out the tables um, and the vendors uh, in the Narthex area before you head out. Um, and I want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists for being with us tonight. Yeah. Um, and to let you all know that, you know, we'll hang out for a few minutes to give you all an opportunity to talk to us, ask us questions, and for us to figure out ways to support you. Um, 10 second comment, Raul. There is no health without mental health. Mentalhealthcareworks.org. Dr. Hankerson. Sure, I would just say everyone please Stop by and see the brothers at the Triumph table tonight. Test your stress level to see if you may be um, at risk and be able to get connected to some of our free counseling and support. Pastor Mike. Yeah. So, I, I, so Dr. Green asked me to do something I want to do. Um, and I, and I want to, and, and permit me to stand because I want to shift modes for a second. But... Um, sometimes we've seen here tonight, for example, the brother who, ex-Marine, ex-police officer, former police officer, who talked about the Hope Center, and that brother came to me for a service. Like many of us, I would have never known he was going through that just by the way he came and spoke to me, right? Because we often learn how to mask, not that he was masking, but we make assumptions about people we engage. And if you'd have asked me before that moment, I'd be like, oh, that's a good brother. He spoke to me tonight. I would have never known his story. And we don't know one another's story. And sometimes we have a hard time being vulnerable in public. And that's why this is necessary tonight. So before I move forward, I want to just thank Dr. Green and her vision for this. Because before there was a Hope Center, and before any of this took place, before Dr. Green got in the Hope Center, Dr. Green always was passionate about black men and fatherhood. That's how we, we really got engaged in working here at the church. This has been a calling for her, and that is an amazing thing. And so I thank God for her passion, for her calling, and I knew that when she came to Hope Center, she's gonna find a way to weave that in, you know, to this work. But what I wanna do right now, brothers, let's all just stand for a second. I, I wanna, I wanna, let this moment be a moment uh, of prayer. Um, um, but I want us to come. If, if you're here tonight, and if you're very intentional about this call, and you are weary of suffering in silence, I want you to come. Secondly, if you're going through something emotionally profound in your life right now. I want you to come down. Next, if you've ever had suicidal ideations in your life, I want you to come down and be honest. This is a safe space tonight where you don't have to be dishonest. Maybe you're here tonight and you've tried to end your life by suicide, and, it, and it, didn't, it didn't happen. You survived it. I want you to come down here, here tonight in this moment of honesty as we pray. Next, if you're here tonight, and you are hurting not just for you, but there's somebody in your life who you seriously know could have benefited from being here tonight. I want you to stand in the gap for them and come down here, here tonight. I want us to pray together. Let's, brother, just move across here for a second. We're gonna 
make room. Because too often, we think that we're being measured because of the pain we're in. Or we think somehow we're less than because of what we go through or suffer through. And the truth is, that's not the case. That there is nothing more powerful than an honest man who can be honest about what he's dealing with. And I know we got sisters here, but I'm speaking specifically to men. And some of these sisters are here representing the men in their life. And so we thank God for that. But nothing more powerful than honest persons who can say, hey, this is tough. This has been hard for me. My journey has been difficult. My journey has been hard. There's been a lot of tears and a lot of pain and a lot of sorrow and a lot of suffering. Because if some of you brothers like me, there were a lot of nights where you cried when nobody was around. Where you sat there trying to self-soothe and self-medicate because the pain was too intense. You tried to act like everything was okay and nobody knew knew the battles you were facing. Nobody knew, and here's a deep thing. Sometimes the pain is so intense that the pain convinces you that nobody else knows what you're going through, that nobody else feels what you feel. That's when the pain is working its best to convince you you're the only one. But when you look around this room tonight, you know you're not the only one. In church, we always talk about the great cloud of witnesses. Well, you got a great cloud of support here. And can I tell you the greatest thing I've learned in my life in this journey, and this is real, someone who for the majority of my pastoral life battled depression and didn't tell nobody. But here's what it taught me. You can be used to heal while God is working on you. So there's no such thing as before God can use me to heal, I got to be healed myself. No, the most beautiful thing is when God is using you while God is working on you. And so tonight, as you stand here, as we pray, and those who are still in the pews, here's what I want you to do. I want you to intercede tonight on behalf of someone you may know, on behalf of somebody that you know may be struggling, tonight and to see lift their name up tonight while we pray because that may be the difference I grew up in the church where you used to hear that people say somebody prayed for me had me on their mind took the time to pray for me I'm so glad they prayed I'm so glad they prayed I'm so glad they prayed for me that's what we're going to do tonight Come on, beloved, let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the foresight to create spaces like this tonight. Thank you, God, for the vision to create spaces like this tonight, oh God. Because the truth is, oh God, that there were those tonight who may not have said much but felt much tonight because of the transparency, because of the honesty, because of the conversations that took place tonight. For some, oh God, this was the beginning of a healing journey. And they've made a commitment tonight to heal on purpose and evolve. God, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this sacred moment, oh God. Because the truth is, oh God, some of us are tired of wearing the mask. Some of us are tired of putting on the costume. Some of us are tired of acting like superheroes, but broken in darkness. So God, we stand tonight together asking, oh God, not that you have your way in our life only, but God, remind us that there are networks of support all around us that are seeking to help us, seeking to heal us, seeking 
to participate in our breakthrough and our deliverance. God, we do not have to walk this walk by ourselves. Because the truth is, oh God, the enemy wants us to feel as though we're alone. The enemy wants us to believe that nobody cares. The enemy wants us to believe that we have to suffer on our own. But God, we stand here tonight rebelling against that idea and that narrative, oh God, believing that we truly are our brother's keeper, oh God. So we come tonight, oh God, declaring that in the midst of sometimes our misery, oh God, that we are committed to healing. And not only healing, but committed to the next generation, oh God. Let us create new narratives and new stories. Let us participate in taking away the stigma and the myth around mental health and wellness. Let us begin to sing new songs of healing and joy, to write new stories of healing and joy, to create new narratives of healing and joy. And how do we do it, God? In spirit, and with our truth. So God, we come here, oh God, believing in your restorative power, your healing power, your redeeming power, your lifting power, your transformative power. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Because, oh God, what we know right now is that there will come a moment, there will come a day where we will look back on this night and remember that this night was beginning of breakthrough for some. That this night was beginning of overcoming the false assumptions and reaching out for the help we need. That this night began a new journey, oh God. For those who've experienced that journey of healing, God, our responsibility is to tell somebody how you use the therapist to deliver us, to tell somebody how you use a psychiatrist to heal us, to tell somebody, oh God, how you use a mental health practitioner to restore hope in our spirit. God, that's our work, to create new narratives, oh God. God, thank you, because this won't be the last time we gather in this format but we declare on tonight that we will participate in the abolition of silence and begin to open our mouths speak over our lives and declare what you have done God we love you we honor you and we thank God for this night and we thank God for those who are around us right now. And we thank God for those who will leave here with new ideas connected to their own wellness. We love you, Lord. We honor you, God. And it's in your name we pray. And we say amen. 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 Come on, give somebody a hug. Tell me you love them on tonight. Listen, as we depart, listen, let's again, let's thank God for Dr. Lena Green and the Hope Center, all the sponsors who made this possible. But for those of you out here, make sure when you leave here tonight, if you need to speak to someone, we got resources outside. And if you want to talk to our panelists tonight, please do so. But we are here for you. Amen. Listen, God bless. Have an amazing evening. Peace and blessings.